the um, on TV live and on live and in person um, during the TV promotion. I lost focus. I was on a teeter totter. I was going up the big ramp and I lost focus and fell off of the teeter totter and uh, cracked my uh, C1 and half and uh, had spinal cord injury uh, four five, which is just below. Um, C1 is, um, they call it the hangman's uh, injury. Uh, I broke my neck basically in two places. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpre. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpre's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe balm today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today has done a multitude of sports. To say that she's a multi-sport athlete is a bit of an understatement. Uh, she started, I'll say, life or her sporting career as a gymnast, eventually moving on to uh, working with a professional ballet company for 10 years has done things like competed at amateur world championships and duathlon. She was ninth at the inaugural Outer Banks Marathon. Welcome to the show, Michelle Mead. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be part of the podcast. And, and so in case, and we, we'll try not to dive too deep into it because um, this isn't really the, the quite the purview of the show. In case anybody's like, well, wait, what was the smart part? You usually do the smart part. Uh, Michelle has done insurance and, and I can't even begin to explain what you already explained to me before we got going, but she helps, she helps small businesses um, now with their insurance and that kind of thing. So that's the smart part, um, which I guess if we were doing this live, we could have people say, yes, I want to hear about that or not. But, <laughs> but for the sake of most people, I'm assuming if they want to know about, more about insurance, they can probably get in touch with you. Um, if they've got a small business that has has needs for such a thing. Absolutely. They can reach out to me any any number of ways. I'm sure you'll have my email and contact information, but yes. we offer health reimbursement arrangements for small businesses, and that enables business owners to offer a benefit. Many times, small smaller businesses are priced out of the small group market. So what we do is we help facilitate by offering um, a benefit program that an employer can fund the uh, insurance uh, for both premiums as well as you know any out-of-pocket medical expenses. So um, they're great programs. They're IRS sponsored, and uh, we work with directly with the um, ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and it's really a fantastic program. I'm so excited to be part of it because so many people need insurance, and health insurance is such an important component to everyone's lives. And you know, I'm I'm a good example of somebody who never thought you needed insurance, and mm -hmm. I always like to say, you know, you don't need insurance until you need it, and right. you know. So it's really, really important um, for everyone to have some type of health insurance. And I always like to say the superheroes of the world who think that they don't need some type of coverage are the ones that are always the ones who need it the most, because <laughs> they're usually the ones that are doing the, you know, extreme sports, zooming down the, you know, skateboard ramps, uh, mountain biking, you know, doing all kinds of at-risk things because mm -hmm. they're in great shape, but, you know. At the, the minute that a crash occurs or something happens, it's bad. Um, yeah. Like what happened to me. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and it's like, you know, it, it's, uh, and we're, we're obviously getting very much going to get into your story. Um, you know, even with like something as minor, I'll say minor, like I, I crashed it, uh, 70.3 Eagle man and shattered my collarbone. It was bad enough. I had to have surgery. Whereas, you know, most people that break their collarbone don't. Uh, it, it was, you know, I hit the pavement and going 25 miles an hour in a, a, essentially a skin suit. So there's, it's just, you know, body against road. 
and uh you know if you like going to a race like that you've got health insurance through the race so number one if nobody tells you that know that because nobody told me that and i had to figure that out for myself that the race would help cover some of that because it was you know but then i you don't expect like i didn't expect to go down you know i didn't expect to hit the pavement it was it was a freak situation going around a turn with crap like I wasn't doing anything extreme. The most extreme part was just the riding fast part, but that's par for the course. There was no hill. It was flat. So it's like, oh, yeah. it's a situation where it, it's not even something that you would think would be an issue. And, and as you mentioned, until it is, <laughs> and then you, need, then you need some kind of, you know, some kind of coverage. I, I would have been in a, a world of hurt. Well, I mean, I had insurance to the ACA at the time, but then having the help from USA triathlons insurance for the race and all that kind of in my membership with them definitely helped. Um, but I guess, I guess we can jump straight into your story since we're already here and we can, we can jump back to the uh, early days in gymnastics and ballet later. Uh, so what, what did happen to you? Why, where were you, uh, you know, Give me the primer, lead me into what what went on. Sure. Well, I was coming off of a, you know, competitive season. I was coming off of my, I just completed a half Ironman and I was getting ready for cyclocross season, which is, you know, kind of that next fall thing that happens in, in, in my seasons normally. Um, and I was asked to participate in um, a television promo for uh Northeastern Ohio Cycling, which was the largest cycling event here in Ohio when it was down at Edgewater Park. So I was like, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so I went down to do the the television promo to promote the event. And um, since I'd been doing a lot of the cyclocross races and stuff, but, you know, doing obstacles and that type of thing was not anything that I hadn't done before. I'd been at our Ray's Indoor Mountain Biking Park. I've done, you know, a lot of the, like, weird things like teeter totters and skinnies and all that kind of stuff you know i mountain bike race as well and cycle across the whole kit and caboodle mm -hmm. and at the um on tv live and on live and in person um during the tv promotion i lost focus i was on a teeter totter i was going up the big ramp and i lost focus and fell off of the teeter totter and uh cracked my uh, C1 in half and uh, had spinal cord injury, 4-5, uh, which is just below. Um, C1 is, um, they call it the hangman's uh, injury. Uh, I broke my neck basically in two places. And I, I'm in the, there's like a 4% survival rate. So I'm in the 4% that actually, you know, survive that injury mm -hmm. um going over i mean i never i never lost consciousness so i knew what was happening and i knew i did something really bad when you know i was kind of laying on the ground and i couldn't move anything um you know i hit the ground and it was kind of like you know kind of like the white light for a minute and then i was mm -hmm. just kind of laying there and i had a little trouble catching my breath um i couldn't really breathe well but i was kind of just on the ground and then i was trying to you know figure out what happened and you know I felt like I was kind of encased in glass it was really really a scary you know experience because I mm -hmm. couldn't move anything like it, it was almost like you were frozen mm -hmm. so um then you know EMS came and you know put me on the flat board and off to uh metro I went and uh pretty much I got to metro and you know they they did they had to do the x-rays and an mri see what they were dealing with and there wasn't really a big option after as soon as they saw what was going on they're like yeah you're going to surgery now <laughs> call your call your call your we're calling your people you know yeah. so you know they called in all my family and everything because you know at that point they really weren't sure what the outcome was going to be yeah um so um, 16 hours later, I came out of surgery and um, it was just a strange time to come out of surgery and I couldn't move anything really. My mm -hmm. 
I, I could feel my toes, I could feel my feet, but my whole upper body from the waist up, um, I had no movement. And that was really, really a terrifying time for me because being as active as I had been, you know, I'm like, this could be a new reality, you know, mm -hmm. and it was really a sobering experience to, you know, not be able to even like move your arms or hands at mm -hmm. all. I mean, it was kind of, it was just like, oof. <laughs> so, you know, then I was just, not sure what the next steps were going to be and yeah. you know i started to feel a little bit of movement you know they had me on pretty high doses of a lot of drugs at that point um just coming out of surgery but within two days um they had uh, agreed that i was a good candidate to go into uh, metro health's uh, occupational therapy and physical therapy group um because i was so fit they felt i had a great opportunity to potentially, you know, get movement back. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, they couldn't really give me any indication as to whether I was going to get anything back. They just, nobody knew they had to wait till the swelling and everything went down. Um, and then, you know, eventually I started to be able to feel a little bit of movement, like in my left pinky finger. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started to, you know, just focus in on that and like moving that. And then, you know, eventually uh, with a lot of work with our occupational therapy, um, the therapists were amazing at Metro Health. They really, you know, walked me through, you know, a lot of things I couldn't do myself. So, you know, they would start with just like basic movements of just moving my arm back and forth and, you know, them manipulating it because I couldn't do it at all. I mean, mm -hmm. I had no, no feeling at all. And, uh, so it, it took um, many, many weeks, you know, I eventually started to get, you know, feeling back in my hand and my left hand. So then, you know, I'm being an Ironman person, you know, you, you get you get one little thing back and it gives you the glimmer of hope. And mm -hmm. then, you know, then it's like, all right, I've got the left back. So there's no reason I can't get the right back. And, you know, it's more of that. I was taking it really a day at a time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, at no point during the whole process of you know recovery did I ever I never had the thought that I wasn't going to get better and that mm -hmm. I wasn't going to get everything back that I had you know I even had the inclination that I was going to do you know I and I still have it today the, the goal of you know still doing a triathlon now I, my 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 goals have shifted a little bit you know I, I no longer you know want to do the full Ironman distance mm -hmm. but um, I've been helping coach others. <laughs> so that gives me the fix that, that gives me the long distance fix that I need as mm -hmm. far as, you know, just being able to, you know, be a positive influence for others. And since I competed at a pretty high level, they, they usually listen to my advice. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I worked with some of the best coaches in the country. I worked yeah. with Rick Katoof, um, out of, uh, he's out of South Carolina now. And, uh, you know, he got me to world championships and, uh, you know, I was competing at a pretty high level at an elite level um, for both marathons and duathlon and, and into tries. So um, still still at it today. But, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of put the Ironman distances at a side, but I yeah. still think, you know, even through COVID times and everything, I still I, I still have the bite to want to try and do uh, uh, at least a sprint. Mm -hmm. So I started running a little bit again. Um, you know, I got my legs back. My legs came back relatively quickly. So when I was going through rehab, trying to get my upper body back engaged, I would do, I would, I set my Strava and I started to walk around the, the spinal cord injury floor up at Metro, mm -hmm. which I, I was always troublesome for them because, you know, usually the people on the spinal cord injury floor are not walking around, <laughs> but I had, um, I, I was in so much pain because I didn't, I couldn't take the pain, like the um, oxycodones and that type of thing yeah. that did not work well in my system. It was shut down my bladder and I had lots of problems on that. So they took me off of all of those meds, um, which left me kind of, you know, wide awake at two in the morning. So mm -hmm. I started with the walker 
and you know it was good because it made my hands work also by holding onto the walker i'd like yeah. make my left hand i'd have to put my right hand on the walker and then i'd start walking around the i started straving my laps around the floor <laughs> so the nurse is like she's up again <laughs> So it's, it's that it's not the same thing, but it reminds me of my father. He was uh, he's in his late seventies now, and he had been in the hospital a, a little while back, a year or two ago. And he would like it was like his thing to like I don't know I guess to show himself that he felt good. So dad, if you're listening, then you can you can tell me later, I guess. But it was like he would get up and be like, I'm. Like I'm doing laps, I'd be like I did 15 <laughs> laps today, or I did I did 30 laps today, or you know he'd have a goal of how many laps he wanted to do, and I, I don't. I, it's more unusual in your case, but in general, I don't know that most patients are getting up and doing laps around the hospital. <laughs> well, once you have Strava, you know it. If, it, if you, <laughs> you don't got, Strava it, it didn't happen. You know that's. <laughs> you, you know how that it. works yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's got to be in there um but yeah it's one of those things that the, like the athlete you know i mean a lot of people ask me you know how did you come back you know mm. and, and i said you know i equate it to my iron man training like mm -hmm. uh, you know once you do it you know any little positive inf impact that you have you know just it, it, it builds on itself. And it's just like doing your Ironman training or just like doing any of your longer distance runs or marathoning, you know, that that's the one thing I think that people don't understand what it takes to, you know, get to that elite level. Like when we watch the Olympians, they make it look so, so easy, right. but you know, if you know what it takes to get there and, you know, I don't ever say, you know, oh, you know, you, you don't, I don't ever ding anybody for not, you know, running super fast because, you know, not everybody has the physical capability of an Olympian, right. but at the same token, um, right. you know, the, the amount of work that they put into getting to that level is so much different than what, you know, an average Joe athlete is going to encounter. And most, most of the, you know, average people, normal people of the world aren't going to be able to even their bodies wouldn't even be able to hold up to that kind of level of training. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's just two different levels. I mean, you know, you've got your five hour marathoners and then you got your two hour marathoners mm -hmm. and both of them have their own different journeys to get to the finish and they all finish. And, you know, for me, it's just a, a different mindset to, to, you know, that, that two hour marathoner has put in, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours more than you know, a five hour marathon or, you know, doesn't really say that that the five hour marathon or didn't still have that same accomplishment because they definitely do. And it's, it's harder to be out there for five hours, to be honest, but, um, you know, that, that at that elite level, they've put in so much, so much effort and, you know, everything from nutrition to, you know, just their training programs and, you know, they live it that, that a lot, you know, most of them, that's what, that's all they do, mm -hmm. you know, the, and I mean, I think people don't really understand what all goes into and, you know, it's not just a few months of preparation or a year of preparation. Most of them have been preparing for three, four or five years, you know, in some instances longer than that. Yeah. So you know, that, that's, that's the biggest difference. I think that's the biggest separation. And I mean, you know, you've experienced. Yeah. I've been through higher well. levels. Right. And I, I tried to become a pro and just, I didn't, that's where the crash happened. Was it the race where I, I waffle in my mind, whether I would have made it, I know I would have been, I was on pace to be right. I mean, it's, you had to be top three. So it depends on, you know, where people actually finish, but after seeing the results and knowing where I was, I was close. And um, I'm like, maybe I would have made it, maybe I wouldn't have, you know, you never know. I was halfway through the bike. It was a, like I said, 70.3. Uh, but yeah, I, it takes an immense amount of preparation, not just physical though, is like the mental and emotional toll that that much training takes on you. And if you're not careful, like it can, you know, consume a part of you and it's not quick. 
it, it's so slow because it, it drag, it goes on for so long. I mean, I post college up to the point of the crash, I was like six years post college, six, seven years post college. I've been doing triathlons for, I think, eight years at that point. Um, I started in mid college when I was still running collegiately. And it, like, that event for me was, it was, it broke me because of all the mental weight and mental strain that training had gone into get to me to that point and just knowing how many years it took me to get there if i wanted to get back like how many more years of that level of effort it was going to take and i just i didn't have it anymore and that's what that's the part i think it's hard it's hard to understand and it's hard to make that call i mean we before we got going we're talking about simone and the simone biles in the in the olympics and her what i would refer to as a very mature decision to say I'm not well enough to compete like it you know it was hard for me to say that I'm not well enough and you've probably experienced this coming back knowing okay yeah I did an Ironman but like right now I'm, I'm just trying to walk down the hall with the walker like that's that's where <laughs> I'm at and, and be really like you know be realistic about like that that's that's tough because you have aspirations and that hunger doesn't go away but nope you have to temper it. Well, and on top of it, I think the biggest the biggest thing for me was staying positive and mm-hmm. not letting, you know, the dark thoughts sink in, like not thinking, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to, you know, use my hands again. I'm going to have mm-hmm. to have rely on other people for the rest of my life to do simple basic things. And, you know, it, and I mean, I learned a lot just from the standpoint of like, even, you know, simple things like, you know, I realized that most hospital rooms are not set up well enough for people with, you know, any kind of spinal cord injury, Mm -hmm. because they set the, the the toilet paper roll is behind you. Mm. (laughs) Like, so you have to turn and reach and try and grab behind you, which is impossible for somebody who's in a neck collar, and they can't, you know, move. And so there were like little things that I learned that I tried to help the hospital with. And I'm like, you know, no, if if you want somebody to try and, you know, do something simple and, you know, it it just is, it's that positive thinking. It's like, okay, here's how we're going to do it the right way. And Mm -hmm. here's how we can help others to, you know, be able to, you know, continue on the journey of, you know, whatever their goal is. And, you know, I was always goal driven, you know, as soon as the doctor told me, well, we're, you know, you're, you're on pace and you're going to be here for a minimal of, you know, 10 weeks. I sat down and went, oh, I'm going to get out in eight, you know, he said, 10, I'm going to do it in eight. So, you know, I started setting goals just based on, you know, what they told me. And, you know, then there were certain things that you had to be able to do in order to get released from rehab. You had to be able to, you know, walk up steps. You had to be able to, you know, step into like a car, you know, so they had like samples of things to, you know, have you do um, in order to qualify you to get, you know, get out and get home. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I knew at the very beginning that I wasn't ready to go home because there were so many things that I couldn't do. I mean, simple things like, you know, moving, you know, beads on a, on a, piece of wire you know they had you basically you worked within the context of having like children's toys that you had when you're you know two and that's what you do in in rehab to try and reconnect those um, nerves and reconnect those muscles and make them work again Mm -hmm. um, when you have a spinal cord injury because there's been a an interruption in those in that communication. Right. So it's, it's definitely, it was definitely a, a long journey. I mean, I still have some residual, like um, I can, I describe it as it, it kind of feels like my hands are always asleep. Like that's, you know, and then it's really weird when my arm actually does fall asleep because then it's like a double, <laughs> a double tingle feel. Um, but I have all my grip back. I have, you know, pretty much my grip is, you know, stronger than any, you know, I'm for my age group, my grip is stronger than it's than most women at at, so and I've been still working out with weights and um, still doing uh, still doing biking, I Mm -hmm. I got back on the bike within I I'm I'm the founder of the global fat bike ride day. So I have a fat tire bike. So I, my goal was, 
after the accident to be able to at least ride a little section of the global fat bike ride day. So I did that with my group and I had about 80 fat bike riders um, in December and I just did a real short part of the ride, but mm -hmm. um, it was really, a lot of people asked me after it happened, they said, well, you're never going to be on the bike again, are you? And I'm like, it's because of the bike that I am, that I was able to come back because mm -hmm. I had the goal of getting back, um, you know, my first couple of days, once I got home, I got out on um, one of my boyfriend's kids bikes and I just, you know, I still had neck collar on. So I, but I just sat on the little kid's bike and I just pushed, sat on it and pushed it down the driveway just to see if I still had the balance. And I did, you know, of course they were all freaked out. They go, what are you doing? I was like, so I was like, somebody's got to be yelling at you. Like, Michelle, get down there. What are you doing? Quit doing that. <laughs> the, the neighbor, the, the little girl who lives two doors down from me, she's about six at the time. She came down and she says, Miss Michelle, do the doctors know you're doing this? She says, I don't think this is a good idea. <laughs> so from she made the, me laugh. And I'm like, there. <laughs> I said, no, Emma, no one has told me. I said, but I am a grown up and I can do what I want to do. <laughs> But it, it gave me the inkling that I could still, you know, eventually, you know, I knew at that point I wasn't ready to go for a full out mountain bike ride. But right. um, it, it was that positive reinforcement that I was able to still balance and I could, you know, still do some of those things. And, you know, that that's really what still ultimately drives me. And, you know, I still I'm, I'm walking, you know, as a matter of fact, I hadn't tried running for about a year because I think I tried to run to too soon after mm -hmm. the injury and it was just wasn't wasn't comfortable i mean i could do it but um so just this past weekend i went out and ran some quarters just to see you know like running and walking and mm -hmm. i got down to about a nine and a half minute pace which i felt pretty good about mm -hmm. you know and i'm like all right so and it wasn't too horribly uncomfortable but yeah it's still not you know i i'm not my marathon days are, I, I don't, I don't envision myself doing another marathon yeah. uh, anytime soon. <laughs> right. right. Uh, well, it, you know, getting back to running after, after taking time off for anybody is uncomfortable the first time, let alone like coming back from such a big injury. Um, it, so you turn about like, the initial afterwards you're going through rehab it, it made me think about so i've spoken to a number of athletes who've gone through a number of injuries um over the years but you're talking about you know the doctor saying 10 months and you're at eight you're at eight months and it made me think about a, a conversation i had recently with um, a professional cr cricketer from south africa uh Luandizua zuma he had a back injury when he was 19, if I remember correctly. And so he's a bowler. So basically like a pitcher in, in baseball. And so he could, he couldn't throw, he couldn't do any of that. And he thought he had just become a professional at 19. He thought his career was basically over before he started. It took him 18 months, which is an eternity for a 19 year old <laughs> to get back to, you know, to doing, and he's playing professionally now, but like, he just, we talked about how setting timelines, at least for him and for me often, if I, if I get injured or the number of injuries I've been through in, in college, setting that timeline sometimes like almost set us up for feeling like failures. It's like, if you're like, oh, I'm going to make it by X date. And then you don't like you have a tendency to forget about the progress you made because oh, you couldn't do x by this certain date did, did you ever have that similar experience or were you just dead set on that that timeline from the beginning i was pretty much dead set on my timeline i mean i, I accomplished everything that i wanted to mm -hmm. in the time that i allocated um you know some of the some of the speed and things that at which i could do things didn't come as fast as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for me, just being able to get the ability to use my arms and hands back was so important. Um, and I mean, I still have some limited mobility issues. Um, 
even today, but I always think back to when I first came out of the when I first came out of surgery and I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I literally had to rely on everybody else to do everything for me. And, you know, I, for me, it was really all about, you know, getting those nerves to reconnect. And once I started to get a little bit of that feeling back, I have just worked it relentlessly until, you know, I, I got pretty much full mobility back. Um, mm -hmm. They're using me as a case study for their program because their program is, it's, it's a pretty rigorous program. It was a uh, two hours of OT in the morning and then, you know, quick lunch break and then another two hours of PT in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most comprehensive and rigorous OT and PT programs in the country. So they use people like me, you know, to quantify and, 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 validate that their approach is correct mm -hmm. um you know unfortunately not everybody can do all the things that i was able to do um a lot of it you know they equated because i was in such good shape pre-injury that that really helped enable me to do some of the things that you know i was able to do mm -hmm. i mean my core and my abs were so strong um even with being in a you know, locked in position with my neck, I could actually, you know, sit up on like the table. And, you know, the physical therapists were like, we never have anybody that can do that. <laughs> and, you know, I was able to walk up stairs without the use of my arms. And they said, you know, just to balance, they said, we, they said, we just don't see people like you come through here. Mm -hmm. You know, they're either really, you know, completely, you know, in a quadriplegic type situation or, you know, so I was really an unusual case for them. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, a combination of, you know, being fit, um, being a relentless pursuer of, you know, I'm very competitive. So any, whatever the um, occupational therapist would tell me to do, I'd always try and at least do one more or two more over what she asked me for. And, you know, I kind of just viewed it as like, well, all right, if you're going to tell me I'm going to do 10, I want to do at least 12. And I tried to maximize everything that I was getting out of what they were doing for me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I didn't even really know what, you know, some of the stuff I didn't even know really what it was doing. But then they took a lot of time and helped me to understand, you know, how connecting those nerves, how making those nerve connections. And they said, sometimes it's a matter, it's a matter of willing your mind to reconnect with your with your body mm -hmm. um so there there is a little bit of that you know i would just sit sometimes you know they'd have me sitting up in the chair and i would just like squeeze a towel you know and just make my hands work and make my hands move on an ongoing basis so you know it's stuff like that that you know things you just don't even think about i mean i still do it now it's kind of like one of my ticks when i get nervous i still i'm like moving my hands around just to make sure that they still work yeah <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, if you don't want to answer this, that's, this is fine. Cause I don't want to like make you live in a dark place where we're having an enjoyable conversation. But so again, thinking about injuries, I, I was thinking about so way back um, episode five of the podcast. So when I <laughs> very first started out talking to um, a former pro cyclist, uh, Cecilia, Cecilia Davis Hayes and uh she was in a crash where it, don't quote me on this. You have to go back and listen to the episode. If you actually want to know what, what happened out of her mouth, but I think she said she broke her pelvis in this crash. And we were talking about, I was dealing with at the time. This was not too long after, you know, me recovering and getting back on the bike and you know, getting back into triathlons and, and just like feeling almost like, PTSD, like getting nervous on fast downhills. And, you know, even if the, like the bike was fine and just feel uh, unstable, you know, just because like, if for me, that situation was out of the blue, like everything was fine until it wasn't like, do, do you have any of those moments where you have to deal with this like momentary sense of panic, I guess I'll say, you know, brought on by things that you wouldn't think would, would make that happen. 
Most definitely. I mean, the first time I got back up on the road bike, I mean, I did, I, I got up on, my, on the road bike on my trainer in the, in the family room. And, you know, it was really, I just didn't feel like I had the balance. And that that's when I ultimately went out and tried the kid's bike. Cause I'm like, Oh, I go, I don't, I don't, it was just a moment of like, just fear of like, Oh, I'm like, I, I, I don't know about this. Um, and the first time I went out on the mountain bike, uh, trail, I, I have a full suspension mountain bike and, um, I thought I was ready. And the, the first time I saw, um, one of the bridges, I'm like, stopped, <laughs> got off, walked, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, I, I still, I still have some of that, you know, yeah. residual, just, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten much better, but mm -hmm. I am, I don't have nearly the speed. I don't, I don't try any of the hard stuff. Yeah. I keep all four tires at all times on the ground. <laughs> I don't do any, I don't try to do any jumps. You know, I yeah. don't do any of the tricks, any of that kind of stuff anymore. I'm like, it, you know, so yeah, I still have, I still have some of that. It's, you know, I, I try not to let it paralyze paralyze me from doing stuff and right. actually i just had new bike new bike day this past uh weekend because i just found that the upright position is a little bit more comfortable mm -hmm. so i bought myself a a live hybrid bike with front suspension so i can do some of the urban assault rides with people because i was killing myself to try and keep up with my fat bike and with my mountain bike yeah. and everybody else has these like hybrids so i'm like all right so i mean i'm still you know very social and i like to go out with people and you know i, I still have the need for speed <laughs> while the other thing i just bought is a new uh i have a new piaggio scooter Mm -hmm. 150 like you know motorized and i'm like wow i should have done this years ago because this motorized scooter is way faster than any of my pedal bikes right <laughs> so when when you ask i'm like eh, you know and people ask me you know oh my gosh you have a broken neck you have pins in your neck and and you ride and you commute to work on a scooter and i'm like you got to live life you know right. you, you only go around once and i'm like if i'm going to get taken out i'm like I've already broken my neck. <laughs> We've done it once. Oh, yeah, I mean, so that's, that's the debate, right? Where it's like, where's the balance between not being active, but like a little bit of carpe diem, I guess, you know, season the day, doing the thing you want to do, but also not like recklessly endangering yourself and like you know bringing it back to which sorry you as the listener weren't privy to this part of our conversation bring it back to Simone Biles like being conscious of like I'm okay to do this and I'm not okay to do this and like having the maturity to decide what it's like it's like that's the that's the tough part is not being afraid. she made the right call oh, right no she, she, she absolutely made, made the right, the right call. call absolutely and, and not, I would say not every, every athlete has the cognizant ability to be able to do that and do it on a world stage like she did. So I applaud her for her, you know, tenacity and, and being, I mean, it was a gutsy move. I mean, I know some people criticize her for that, but in my opinion, she did exactly what she needed to do. And that was the smart thing to do. Um, right. She could have, you know, people don't even understand what it takes to do some of the things that she can do. And if, if you're not spot on 100%, you know, she could have, she could have died and, yeah. or, you know, been permanently paralyzed. And, you know, that's not a risk that anyone should take just because of pressure from a coach or pressure from somebody else. I mean, she did exactly what she needed to do. And, you know, I applaud her for her, her strength and, and her focus. And she's still, she's, I mean, she's the greatest of all time. And in, in my opinion, as yeah. far as gymnastics goes, we won't see another Simone in our lifetime. I don't think, I mean, they just don't come around that often. And yeah. so I was thrilled to see her be able to get back up on the beam and, you know, still bring home a medal and, yeah. you know. Well, and, and so, so back us up a little bit to, you know, you spent time as a gymnast. So you have a little bit better, I'll say internal understanding of gymnastics because 
most of us don't have anybody in our family in gymnastics. So we didn't do gymnastics. It just comes around for, for most of us, it comes around once every four years. We wash it. It's amazing. <laughs> uh, it looks, they make it look so, you know, relatively simple unless something goes wrong. And it's like, awesome. But then, you know, like, like we were talking about, it's just the, the comprehension of the difficulty of it because not, not just physically, but having to be so mentally dialed in to hit everything. And then, so I'm leaving a lot of threads for you to answer here, but just <laughs> brightened up a little bit. So it, it, it makes me wonder too, because, you know, we don't often see like, or not, all, generally speaking, there's many younger uh, girls and ladies that are competing in the Olympics in gymnastics, just the nature of the sport. And since, Simone is comparatively older. She's not old by any means. Um, I wonder if that plays a role in her ability to step back and say, no, like, you know, I, I, I like, I think about the, the obviously, which I, I don't know enough to get into this conversation, but there's like the issues with abuse with use of gymnastics. But even that aside, I wonder about the power dynamic between adult coach and you know teen athlete like does the teen have enough i'll say self-confidence although maybe that's not the right word to know hey i'm not okay like and i'm going to step back or is it like generally not no i i can tell you based on you know my experiences with my coaches i would have done anything my coach told me to do i mean and that was all the way up through you know i competed all the way up through till i was 18 and anything that coach told me to do i would do it and it really was a mentality of you know power through no matter Mm -hmm. what and you know i I still think you know today i still have that some of that same you know i'm more self-driven you know i don't need but you know any coach that you know will walk you through that that's where um i think some of the coaching that she has is fantastic Mm -hmm. um as well because it takes a lot more for a coach to tell you to back off and to not do something than it is to just say, you know, go ahead and power through. And I mean, you can look at Carrie Struggs and Bella right. Crowley and, you know, that whole dynamic, you know, she should have not powered through. I mean, she had a, 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 a sprain or a break or a fracture and, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, yes, it made for drama and it made for great TV, but, you know, I, I don't think it was necessarily a great precedence <laughs> for, right. you know, the sport. Um, and, you know, so I think, I think we have gotten better. I think people from a coaching standpoint have gotten better and at least more aware. And I think, um, the pandemic definitely has impacted a lot of people as well. You know, mental health is a lot, is more on the forefront because I think the isolation that people have felt and, um, you know, not being able to, you know, see people. I know when I was in the hospital, being able to have visitors and having people come to see me was um, a a big component. Once I got well enough to, you know, be able to see people. I mean, right after surgery, I didn't want to see anybody. And, you know, I was, couldn't, you know, function well enough to, you know, want to see people. But once I got better, it was really helpful. And, you know, I think, having a coach and having someone that is, you know, there looking out for you is, is really important. And, you know, when you start looking at the pandemic and the isolation of people who didn't get to have visitors when they were really at their sickest or trying to recover, it helps in your recovery because it gives you something to look forward to. It gives you some positive that, oh, you know, there's stuff that's going on in the outside world that, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't, you don't really get to know about other than if someone comes and sees you. So um, I think, you know, from the Olympic standpoint and, you know, with the coaches and everything that, that I think it, it's made a bigger impact um, with everything that's been going on in the world. And because it had been delayed for a, a whole year. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, that, that delay was, it was helpful for some of the younger athletes, but, you know, for someone like Simone, who's been at it for much longer, you know, it, it would be like you getting ready for a full Ironman and then them telling you, nope, not going to do it. Yeah. 
you got to train a whole nother year, you yeah. know, and you've peaked for that one event and you're ready to crush it. And then they tell you, nope, we're not doing it. So. Yeah. yeah. And that, and that, <laughs> I mean, that happened to a, a number of people this, I mean, this past year, that that's exactly what they were doing and they had to reset. And I, I you know, I did the 70.3. I was never really interested in the full, um, but like just thinking about the mentality uh, of having to reset and redo an entire year. I mean, I kind of went through that with like crashing and, and having to reset and just, it's such a big barrier to throw at you. And there are definitely people that overcome it, but they're like, there's some people that won't because it, it, it you have to be able to break it down like you did where it's, it's not a year. It's what do I need to do today. And like, that, right. I don't know that everybody has that skill or is strong in that skill yet. And without it, it it's just like, like a marathon or anything that's long. People go, well, how do you run a marathon one mile at a time? You, you know, you don't, yep. you don't try to take out the whole thing at once. You just one mile at a time. How'd this mile go? how the next mile go? It's the same. It's like just this day, the next day. And that's it's it. a small bit. Sometimes yeah. it's even hour by hour. You know, you wake up and you go, oh, I mean, one of the things that will say that saved me in the hospital when I was not able to do anything is I watched marathon of, you know, Doctor Who and uh, Star Trek Next Generation because <laughs> I'm a little bit of a sci-fi geek as well. Yeah. So that was that was one of the few things that kept me going is like, you know, having that on TV and having, you know, something to distract because you have to have some level of distraction as well, especially, especially when you're, you know, your mind can go into dark places. And so having those, you know, things to do and, you know, a little bit of a fun distraction, at least something that you liked and enjoyed to watch it, that that was helpful as well. Yeah. Well, maybe we can talk about sci-fi afterwards <laughs> we we watch we watch plenty of that um but we're, we're starting to wind down on time I, I i always feel i always feel like i don't ever get to all the things that i want to talk to with my guests and, and you're no exception to that but um i i'm gonna ask you this question so i asking a question to the same question to everybody for an entire season this year's question i'll ask you and it kind of pertains to your situation kind of doesn't but I still think you'll have pretty good insight on it. And the question I'm asking everybody is, how do you stay motivated after failing to reach a goal? <sighs> For me, it's really all about, I am just so competitive that um, that fuels me not reaching a goal or being just short of a goal fuels my desire even more to accomplish whatever that task is, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's, you know, I, I was riding with Emma the other day and, um, you know, she's now uh, she's just turning 10. So we were riding bikes and, you know, she said something that just made me laugh because she has that same drive as a 10 year old that she has, she had me as the inner 10 year old, we were, we were riding and a lady passed us with a hybrid bike and, Emma took off like a crazy, crazy fast on her, you know, BMX bike. And then she, she caught up to her, got right in front of her and then, you know, let her pass. And then she came back to, to me and, you know, she, she just looked at me. She says, was that a definitive pass? And I said, yes, Emma, it was a definitive pass. And she goes, good. She said, that's all I needed to do today. So I'm like, that kind of sums up how I approach life. It's like, do we have a definitive pass? Yes. And if we do, then it's like, okay, we've done what we needed to do today. And, you know, I do that in my business life. I do that in my personal life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, nonsensical, like, you know, there was real, no, no reason for it, but it was like, well, I'll see somebody up ahead and I'm like, I got to catch them. You know, I don't care if they're 90 years old with a walker. I'm like, I got to catch them. I got to catch them. <laughs> Gonna chase them down. It does, does not matter. I, I, un I absolutely understand that. And that's it, funny enough. That's a tendency. Like I was pretty tired for my run today. And, but even just, I'm out on a run. There could be somebody ahead of me. And I find myself like picking up the pace. Like I got to get in front of it. It's just, it's so 
ingrained after doing it for so many years that you like you have to I, I at least have to consciously be like slow down you don't have to pass this person <laughs> as fast as you can like it's it's okay just relax I have to coach myself through that, but no, that's, I, but I think it's I've, great. I've learned it's not a bad thing, you know, to definitively right. pass no right. matter what, you know, definitively pass and you will be, uh, you'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Um, Michelle, where, where can people find you, get in touch with you, see what you're up to, see how your journey is progressing, all that kind of stuff. I am on all manners of social media. So I'm on, on I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Michelle Lee Mead on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me through LIG Solutions and we're located right here in Independence. We're in Ohio. Um, so I will give you, oh, my email is um, M-I-C-H-L-M-E-A-D at AOL.com. That's my personal email. And then my work email is M-M. EAD at LIGsolutions.com. Awesome. Thanks for hanging out with me today, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me, Jesse. It's been fantastic. And uh, I look forward to uh, working more with you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you.